And I'm guessing that many of you, since you're geology fans, have heard the name J. Harlan Bretz, and you maybe feel like you know the story of J. Harlan Bretz. But I've got some stuff tonight that's brand new to me, and I'm guessing, therefore, brand new to you. And my main question was, who was this guy? Why did he show up in eastern Washington when he did? It was 100 years ago, by the way, when he first showed up. In the 1920s, he showed up in eastern Washington. And why was he able to see this amazing stuff and piece this story together when nobody else could do that? What was so unique about this person? And the hint is he already had previous experience as a geology mapper before he arrived in the Scablands that particularly primed him to understand the channeled Scablands pretty quickly. Pretty quickly he had a lot of this stuff figured out. And there's other kind of twists and turns with this story. So that's the plan. I did lead a public field trip. I, I, I take turns leading public field trips with a guy named Carl Loquist, who's a friend of mine who works here as well. And we lead these big public field trips every uh, four times a year. And my trip was uh, in late, uh, the first Sunday of November of this past year. And because I was working on all that Brett stuff, and here's a photo of Brett's working in his office at the University of Chicago, um, I, I decided to build the, the field trip around Brett's, which again was a departure for me. And this field guide and, and all the field guides that we have done uh, are on my website, nicksentner.com. So you can go and get a PDF and look at these uh, more specifically. But we're really going to focus on this guy uh, before he arrived in Washington. We're certainly going to talk about the work that he did here in Washington a bit. And then we'll talk about his retirement years where he was finally uh, accepted. So um, let's start... Uh, we got kids here, we got people of all ages and backgrounds. Let's start with a kind of a J. Harlan Brett's nutshell. In other words, let me give you the J. Harlan Brett story, assuming you've never heard of this guy, and we'll do it in less than uh, eight minutes. You can, you can time me, okay? Less than eight minutes, what's the conventional J. Harlan Brett story? Okay, here goes. Eastern Washington, the Cascades, my backyard, Vantage, Washington, there's where Chelan, we were there last night, Spokane, we'll factor in tonight, and a dinky town called Washtuckna. So out here in this place that is quite barren even today, it was very barren back then. There was no Columbia, uh, sorry, there was no uh, Grand Coulee Dam yet, there was no uh, Columbia Basin Irrigation Project. So this was a harsh landscape back in the 1920s. And Brett's was out here during the 1920s in the summers making maps, making measurements, and putting together with each passing summer, with each passing day, on foot, and l jumping on trains and going to the next train stop and getting off and walking again across the area. And with the course of a number of summers in the 1920s, Bretz was able to put together a bunch of field evidence and a bunch of scientific papers that said what? That said there was an incredible flood of water during the Ice Age. He called it the Spokane Flood, singular. The Spokane Flood. All of his papers in the 1920s, J. Harlan Bretz is who we're talking about, was out here on foot and put together this story, this evidence for this crazy, catastrophic, unimaginable amount of water that was racing across eastern Washington, digging up the ground and leaving all these absolutely unbelievable landforms. By the time we get to the 1930s, Bretz is considered a crazy person even in the 19, late 1920s when he was presenting his papers. We'll get into it in a bit. But from the 1920s through the 30s, through the 40s, through the 1950s, through the 1960s, nobody is teaching about a catastrophic flood of water across eastern Washington. The Missoula floods, that's what I'm talking about. The Ice Age floods, the Bonneville flood. Nobody was teaching. So I know geologists who are in their retirement years now, and they were in graduate school in the 1960s, and they are Ice Age floods geologists now, and they were not taught at all about J. Harlan Bretz in, let's say, 1968. The happy ending to the story is in the 1970s, when now it's super easy to fly to Washington from all parts of the world, 
to drive out to all these locations without breaking a sweat, to take photographs on the ground, to take photos from the air. Before Brett died, he was given the highest award possible by the Geological Society of America, the Penrose Medal in 1979. It took three tries to convince people to give him that award. That's a whole nother story. But it's a Disney ending because he was finally, before his death, uh, embraced as a maverick ahead of his time geologist. And now all of us who are teaching geology and know the researchers that are out here embrace all of this work, every last piece of work he did. In many ways, his work is still the most accurate description down to the tiniest little place uh, that we have a hundred years after the fact. So that's the J. Harlan Brett story. And that's who we're talking about tonight. But what is my approach tonight? To try to give you some backstory. So I'm a history guy, I just like history. I like old black and white photos. I like art architecture and all sorts of things like that and how cities are morphing through time. You know, I follow certain groups on social media like Vintage Seattle and all that. I love that stuff. And Brett's is gonna play a part in the old days of Seattle the old days of the Columbia River Gorge, that's a surprise to you perhaps. In other words, there's other places that are part of the Brett story in addition to his most famous place. So one more preamble before we get into it. I'm going to try to focus primarily on Brett's, give you a little hint of what he was finding. But when we get to the questions tonight, uh, the uppercase questions tonight, I'm hoping that it can be geared and you can kind of be disciplined towards our topic tonight. And I'm going to put some of the Ice Age floods questions off until tomorrow when we start talking about depth of water, speed of water, the, the roll call of landforms and, and unusual things. We'll do a little bit of that tonight, but I want to focus mainly on the Brett's career himself. Hope you're up for that. Okay, to the whiteboard he goes. So I'll show you this on occasion. This is kind of our, um, our way to keep track of time with Harley. So right off the bat, he was born Harley Bretz. He was in Michigan, grew up on a farm. Harley Bretz, that was his given name. He made up J. Harlan Bretz because all the scientific papers back in this day uh, had, you know, T.C. Chamberlain or I.C. Russell or all, you know, all the G.K. Gilbert, etc. So he, he made up the uh, first initial with no period, by the way, and Harlan instead of Harley, and then the last name Bretz. So uh, we'll keep coming back to this. Let's do the first part of this. He was born in 1882, grew up on a farm in Michigan, uh, in the upper Midwest, similar to my background, it turns out. A lot of farming, whatever. Go to high school, no real interest in the sciences necessarily. He goes to Albion College, a Methodist uh, college, liberal arts college. He wasn't particularly into the religion scene, but that's where he went. And he met his future wife there, Fanny, who became Fanny Bretz right after they graduated from college. And his first teaching job was at a high school, Flint, Michigan, Flint High School. 1905, I guess, he took that job. And he was there for a couple of years in Flint and was teaching natural science, mostly biology. He was a biology major in college, so this guy wasn't even really viewing himself as a geologist until out of undergraduate college. But the first little morsel of geology with Brett is that during the school year, when he was teaching science at Flint, Michigan High School, and over the summers, he would ride his bicycle around the hills surrounding Flint, and just for fun, apparently, made a glacial geology map. He maybe had a handful of geology classes at Albion College, and here's this guy out making a map. Now, would you do that if you had just a couple of classes in your back pocket? This guy was doing that. So he put together these hand-drawn maps of glacial moraines, which are ridges made out of poorly assorted glacial rocks, uh, different moraines of different ages, he thought, some kettle lakes, uh, some other glacial features, and uh, uh, during this time when he was a high school teacher, he happened to go to a geology society meeting in Ann Arbor. Uh, I don't know where he was in the school calendar, but he showed up 
kind of not part of the club, essentially. I see Russell as a famous geology name. He was there. Bailey Willis was there. These are names that we know out here in the Pacific Northwest, but they were back there at the University of Michigan at the time. And Brett showed this kind of handmade map. Here's this high school teacher showing this glacial map of the deposits around Flint. And these guys at Michigan, who were pretty uh, well-respected glacial geologists across the country, USGS, et cetera, they were really impressed with this guy. And they're like, hey, man, you should go out to Washington. They got all sorts of cool stuff out there. And I think Bailey Willis had just talked about climbing Rainier, you know, back in whatever, 1903 or something like that. So uh, Brett's leaves Flint. He takes the train with his young bride, Fanny, out to Seattle, and he teaches at three different Seattle high schools between 1907 and 1911. Okay, what's the point of this? Well, my point with all of this, before he shows up at the Scablands to do his famous Ice Age floods work, is that he's learning how to identify quote-unquote normal glacial deposits. In other words, deposits from the ice sheet itself, just like in uh, Michigan. Let me go back to that field guide. Do you know Seattle at all? Do you know that many of the hills in Seattle uh, were actually leveled in the first decade of the 1900s? Seattle was expanding dramatically. They were trying to create new land to develop. And somebody had the idea like, oh, these hills in Seattle are all made of sand and gravel. Turns out they're glacial deposits. And let's take those hills and move them and dump that sand and gravel in these hills in downtown Seattle. We'll move them and we'll just dump them into Elliott Bay. We'll create land. And that land today is where the football stadium is, the baseball stadium, et cetera. There's a bunch of acreage in downtown Seattle that's actually stuff that used to be in these hills and got moved. Well, why is that important? Well, Brett's is teaching at, let's see if I can remember now, uh, Broadway High School no longer stands except for, I think, a portion of it right there, Broadway Avenue, if you know downtown Seattle. Uh, he taught at Franklin High School for a year, but not the Franklin High School that many of us know. It was an older version of Franklin High School. And then his last two years, he, he taught a, a total of four years as a high school science teacher in Seattle. He taught at Queen Anne High School, which was a brand new building at the time, perched right above what now is the Space Needle in the Seattle Center. So this is an important part of the story because they're exposing these hills and Brett's is hiking with his students. He's like, let's get out of this high school classroom over the lunch hour, I don't know, let's go out and let's, let's take a look at these hills. These hills aren't gonna be around much longer and let's make careful measurements of this glacial till and reconstruct the fact that there was a huge ice sheet, the same ice sheet that we were talking about last night that was the two arms that were battling to make Lake Chelan trough. That ice sheet was also 3,000 feet of ice over Seattle at one time. And that ice sheet got as far south as just south of Olympia. Yelm, if you know that, Tenaino, those dinky little towns in South Puget Sound, there are some terminal moraines. Well, guess who mapped all that stuff? Brett's. Here's one main theme for tonight. Brett's was always with students. He was always in the field with students. Here, he's doing all sorts of advanced geology, mapping, making notes, but he always has students with him, whether it's high school students in his classroom, during a school day, or he had a hiking group called the Peripatetics, or he was like, a, like an early Boy Scout group. These guys would walk tens of miles in one day, Brett's and a bunch of these high school kids. I'm sure they were all throwing rocks at each other and screwing off. Uh, but he was out there with his boots on the ground doing all this amazing geology. So he was making maps eventually that are still the hallmark maps of the glacial deposits in Puget Sound. Okay. How's this feeling to you? Is this, this, is this uh, an interest to you? It is to me. Developing this career, and I can't hold it, Brett's isn't going to get to the Scablands and start his famous work until by the age of 40. He's mid-career, mid-life before he begins. He's not right out of college doing this controversial stuff.
So he's got more than a decade of experience as a geologist before he ever sets foot in what is now the most famous landscape that Bretz has done his work. So he does all this work, takes all these careful notes, and after his four years in Seattle high schools, he says, I think I love this geology stuff so much, I think I don't want to be a high school teacher anymore. I think I want to go back to school. And so he goes to the University of Chicago, and he makes a dissertation, a PhD, at the University of Chicago as a graduate student uh, between 1911 and 1913. Let me show you his map that he made using all those high school trips. And if you're a Seattle person, I don't know, when you watch the replay of this, you can kind of freeze the frame, I suppose, or pause it and look at the details. Uh, this is a big map. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'll just kind of give you a little scan. This is the actual map created by Bretz for his dissertation of the Seattle area. I can show you these units. So based on his experience in Michigan, based on his experience in Seattle, he's reading as much as he can in the Seattle Public Library and the University of Washington Geology Library. And he's making this map that nobody had really seen before. Nobody had done this work before. A couple people had, but he's come up with this incredible detail. Not only where the ice sheet was, but a bunch of Ice Age river channels where he's developing this skill. Remember, he's just starting in geology. I know he's in graduate school, but just a couple of years ago, he was making his own maps in Michigan. So he's an advanced thinker without a whole lot of experience, and he's an independent thinker. He's not a follower. He's not, he's not following other people's work, and that's one of the strengths of this guy. He knows what he wants to do, and he goes out and does it. Okay, we gotta keep the story moving. It's already 620. So he finishes his PhD, and his first job teaching geology at a university is back in Seattle. And it looks like, here we go. He's gonna, he buys his house, his dream house. He and Fanny are setting up shop. Wow, we're gonna be here in Washington the rest of our lives. Remember, he doesn't know about Eastern Washington yet. And he only lasts teaching at the University of Washington for one year. And there's different ways to tell the story of what happened. Um, I'll make it quick. He clashed severely with a fellow faculty member at the University of Washington at the time named Ed Saunders. And Edwin Saunders taught at my school in Ellensburg when it was a normal school. And Ed left here and he went over to the UW and he was established by then. He was a paleontologist. And basically the story is told that Brett says, I want to do all my teaching in the field. I want to keep hiking and doing all this stuff with my students. And uh, the story goes, Saunders said, no, 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 no. Everything's classroom. Every, we got the textbooks. We got our, our fossil collections. We'll do everything in this musty classroom. I'm sure there's more to this story, but that's the main story that Brett said, screw it, I'm out of here. And so he went back to the University of Chicago and took a full-time faculty position where he got his PhD and was at the University of Chicago from 1915, I guess, until 1947. Chicago was his home till his dying day. So he never lived in Washington, Bretz didn't, except for that one year teaching at the UW and the four years earlier teaching at Seattle high schools. We're not to the Ice Age floods yet. Let's keep it going. So. Brett starts at the University of Chicago, and he says, well, okay, I'm going to take over the field courses. I'm going to teach a fall field class. Every September, I'm going to take our undergraduates up to the Baraboo Hills in southern Wisconsin. And for 30 years or something, he would take students, and, and they would tent up there, and they would, he would teach these undergraduate geology majors how to make geologic maps. And to get from Chicago to the Baraboo Hills, he went right by our farm on US-12. I'm sure of it. He went right through Fort Atkinson, my hometown. So I'm feeling closer and closer to Bretsch just because of these weird coincidences between where he's from and his kind of teaching life. And I taught for 20 years a, a field course for our students. So I can, I can relate on many ways to him. There's other reasons I can't relate to him, and I don't know. We'll, I won't talk about that now, I guess. But he was also then, every summer as a University of Chicago faculty member, 
taking three to four graduate students every summer, starting in 1915, out here to the Pacific Northwest. So he's always with students, right? So he's out now with his three graduate students spending six weeks, eight weeks, and the plan was to go to a different place in the Northwest every year. He'd already figured out the ice, ice sheet thing in Puget Sound. So back here, you know, at the dawn of World War I, essentially, for the U.S. involvement, he's taking the train with his three grad students to Portland, and they're riding the train up the Columbia Gorge, getting off every once in a while, walking like crazy, and making maps of the deposits they find in the Columbia River Gorge. This is upstream from Portland. This is on the Washington-Oregon state line. And at the time, a roadside geology book, the first one of its kind, was being written for the brand new Columbia River Highway that was being put in in 1915. So Bretz has got all these beautiful little diagrams and things in that roadside geology book for the Columbia River Gorge, 1915. And the thing is the raging success. They sell out, they make another edition, etc. And so he's got this knack for making diagrams and things for the public, again, all coming from his work with grad students. Okay, for the first time with his work in the Columbia River Gorge, Bretz is starting to get interested in something weird. Pause for dramatic effect. He starts finding in the Columbia River Gorge granite boulders, white, big, beautiful granite boulders. And they're not in the floor of the Columbia Gorge. They're perched up on the side of these gorge walls. They're still there today if you know where to look. He's like, why are those granite boulders up that high? There's no granite in the Columbia Gorge. They clearly were brought from the east. Was the Columbia River that deep? Even if it was, why would these boulders be up high? And he came up with this interpretation that maybe there were some icebergs in a bunch of water coming down the Columbia River Gorge from Tri-Cities to Portland. And so he and his students during these summers, 1915 through 1917, started walking. Each summer they walked a little further upriver into Eastern Washington. And that last summer, Bretz and his students were walking to Prosser, taking photos of these erratics, Mabton, Trinidad, Soap Lake. I mean, he was up here for the first time on foot, but he didn't have any Ice Age flood story in mind. He just had kind of a lake, and some earlier geologists had an idea of a Lake Lewis, kind of a submerged area of the Pacific Northwest. And those erratics, those boulders that were rafted in on ice were part of the story. But that finally got him interested in this story. How we doing? Let's take a quick break and share with you that I never really was interested in Brett's. This is a confession of mine. I've never really taught much about Brett's. Mostly because Brett's was, the Brett's story as I started with was full of conflict. I'm not into conflict was full of ego, was full of controversy, was full of turf and status and puffing up of one's chest. And that's not what I'm about. I, I, I like to think that I'm an inclusive person. And, and Brett's story is kind of the opposite, at least the way I always hear it. Uh, and, and so the story of he's presenting all this stuff and everybody says he's wrong and there's underhanded kind of you know drama going on and tenure and professional papers, not my thing. But I wanna thank John Sonickson, who lives in Spokane. He's not a geologist, uh, but he caught wind of this Brett story and wrote this book, which is kind of what got me interested in Brett's as a person. And I feel much closer to Brett's. I'm not still sure that I would love hanging out with Brett's in my backyard, to be honest, but I feel closer to him because of the similarities and backgrounds uh, to a certain degree. I'm certainly not the mind that Brett's was, but Brett's Flood is an excellent book, easy to read, even for folks that don't know the story, and uh, I highly recommend it. And I, I want to thank uh, John Sonickson for writing that book, which I read on an airplane last summer and kind of got, got rolling on this, on this story. 
Okay, let's finally get to some of the stuff that Brett's is finding in eastern Washington, just to give you a little taste and a little bit more on the logistics of this. And then we'll turn it over to you, and I think we'll go wherever you want, because there's a lot of stuff to share with you. Okay, so the story goes, actually I think I, the story doesn't go, I think I have kind of figured this out with a little bit of help from folks here and there. We're now ahead to 1922, and there are three high school teachers, we're back to the high school teachers now, my, my wife is a high school teacher, my dad was a high school teacher, science teacher for a long time, so I can relate. There were three high school teachers at Lewis and Clark High School in downtown Spokane. Alonzo Troth, Joseph McMacken, and Thomas Large. And I've made contact with family members of all three of those folks today, and they've helped me with some background. But Thomas Large in particular, longtime teacher of science at Lewis and Clark High School, wanted to teach some local geology in his classroom in the early 1920s. There's a lot of interesting geology surrounding Spokane. But there hadn't been much work done at the time. So Thomas Large from this high school starts writing letters to any geologist he knows of and says, would you please come to Spokane? I'll loan you my car. I'll give you a little bit of spending money. Or I don't know what the details were there. But apparently he, he invited any geologist he knew of to come to Spokane, make some maps or do some kind of learning about the Spokane area so that Thomas could teach in his class. And Thomas managed to convince two people to come to the Spokane area. Joseph Pardee, who is famous for being a Montana geologist and uh, long before 1922 uh, discovered uh, Glacial Lake Missoula, and J. Harlan Bretz at the University of Chicago. So Bretz had done his work down here in the Columbia River Gorge. Bretz gets this letter, apparently. Nobody's found the letter, by the way and says, yeah, I'll take the train out. I got three grad students this summer, summer of 1922. I'll meet you at the train station in Spokane. You're going to loan us your Model T, Thomas? Great. Uh, we'll start, you know, driving in 1922 on a couple of, you know, a couple of gravel roads as soon as we get out of Spokane. And this is the part of the story that intrigues me the most, and I have not been able to put it, I haven't been able to flesh this part out. Maybe. 500 people, five, some of you watching uh, will know a friend of a friend and we can figure this out. Apparently, those three high school teachers already had the Ice Age Floods idea on the brain. Possibly were even teaching it in their classrooms based on some of the features that they were seeing, especially southwest of Spokane. There's a couple little hints of that in some things that Large wrote later saying, Hey, man, Alonzo Troth was kind of the godfather of this idea of Ice Age floods. But, of course, there's no acknowledgement of that by Bretz. Bretz is the guy who had the, the brainstorm, according to Bretz's work. So anyway, these, these high school teachers in Spokane were instrumental at least in getting Bretz to come to the area, loaning him a car. Out they go, Bretz and his three grad students. And let's give you a sense of what they were able to find pretty quickly. And I'll show you a map that they made in the 1920s. All of these dots are not cities, but Lus, kitchen flour. So I think you've heard this before if you've seen one of my programs before. Before the Ice Age floods, we can visualize just a thick blanket of soil, basically. Kitchen flour silt, uh, Lus we call it that mantled everything between the Cascades and the Rocky Mountains before the Ice Age floods. So we're picturing this for all of eastern Washington before the Ice Age floods. And below the average of 50 feet of this windblown silt, like in the Palouse today, there's all these layers of basalt bedrock. That's the German chocolate cake we've talked about before. So, Lus from the air, underneath the 50 feet of Lus, bedrock, but it's all um, basalt. I've showed you this before. We know that the basalt doesn't go everywhere in eastern Washington. It's confined primarily to this area. So this is a freak show times two. 
Freak show number one is to have these crazy Hawaiian lavas 16 million years ago flooding and making the area flat. And the second freak show is then to bring in this water. Brett didn't know where the water came from, by the way, for a long time. But Brett was starting to find evidence of catastrophic floods of water. What did he find? I don't know if you can decipher what this is, but this is pretty much this, but with a little bit more detail. And this is a key observation. And especially in those couple of first field years that Brett's had with his students, he made this discovery pretty quickly. These are divides. In other words, this is a bunch of kitchen flour, but it's not perfectly flat landscape. It's a mature landscape, as Brett's called it. So you can kind of see that this, it's not flat, but it's kind of rolling. And there was a pattern as to where you have kind of a crest. It's not really a super tall ridge now. Don't think of that, please. But just think of a, a, a kind of a knuckled up part where there's loose. And then there's these streams, these local streams that are draining away from the divide. Do you hear what I'm kind of saying? Each of these are kind of subtle knuckles and like my finger, actually this worked perfectly. So the shadows are pretty good too. So the knuckle is on the, is still made of loose. And here are these little streams coming both ways away from these little knuckles. You got me? A mature topography took a long time to develop. There's these subtle little streams kind of cutting in to this kitchen flower. Well, Bretz was able to see those on foot, hiking up and over each of those wrinkles, mapping out each one of those little drainage divides. The maps were not very good at that time. The topographic maps were non-existent in many places. But here's the first crucial thing that got Brett's thinking about Missoula floods, or at least catastrophic floods. As he was mapping day after day with these students in 1922 and 1923, etc. They were recognizing that there were these channels where the knuckles are gone, the subtle little street, stream drainages are gone, and the list is gone completely. So it's one thing just to show this and say, yeah, there's these big canyons out in eastern Washington that don't have any rivers in the bottom of them, and the, and the canyons are steep-walled and flat-floored, and they don't make any sense. And that, that is true, and that's the easiest place to go. We'll go that tomorrow night with Grand Cooley and, and Moses Cooley, etc. But a more subtle thing that Brits really locked into in that first field season of 1922 is the fact that you've got these channels you go okay mature topography gone mature topography looks exactly like this stuff over here but there's no connection of it and then as he continues to make these maps i'll keep going over by chalet this is kind of made up now but let me let me do one more here I kind of like this. There's even places where that mature landscape, where those thick soils are a complete island. And the transition from that thick soil island to the scab land, where it's nothing but basalt exposed, and the basalt exposed is ripped up, he was making maps like this for the first time. And seeing that those channels actually had a pattern to them. And the only way he could explain that was to have this crazy amount of water, especially, did I show it? I, I guess I didn't. Especially in places where the divide, remember the knuckle? The subtle divide continued on the other side. Now, why would you just have a regular river cut across a divide like that. If it was just a normal Ice Age river, 
which was the opposite thought at the time. And Bretz was trying to convince himself, maybe this is just the water kind of ca casually draining off of the ice sheet, kind of like he had over at Puget Sound, by the way. He said, these aren't like that because they're crossing divides. You need a lot of water, deep water moving fast to overtop a divide like that and wash it away. I'm excited now, I'm yelling at you. This was the hallmark of those early maps. And oh, by the way, there are no lakes at all. This is before the irrigation project now. Today there's a lot more lakes from moving the water around and ponding the water and O'Sullivan Dam and all that. But back then in the 20s, the lakes were all confined to these places where that subtle landscape was gone. So the channeled scab lands with lakes and deep potholes and gravel bars and everything else, they were unusual looking maps. And his critics back in the 1920s said, yeah, yeah okay, I guess, but that's just, you know, that's just meltwater coming off of an ice sheet. And he's like, it can't be. And he kept going back to those channels and remeasured and remeasured to figure that out. So let me show you, now that you have the concept of those early features that Bretz was seeing with his students, I got to finish up the story. Let me show you a map from 1928. So is this the same one I showed you before? No, I showed you the Puget Lowland glacial map, right? Here's his plate out of his publication in 1928. He'd only been in the area for five years. And these are his colors. It's before computers, obviously. I don't know how he's drafting these maps on his desk at the University of Chicago. Here are his units. And it's maps like these that were ridiculed. He only really made one obvious error, and that is he had a bunch of the ice sheet sitting on top of Spokane, which we now know is not true. Instead, we now know the Ice Age flood water came over Spokane. But all through the 1920s and even into the 30s, Bretz didn't know where the water came from. He had no idea. And obviously that was one way to argue against him. It's like, you want a big flood? Okay, but where's the water coming from? He didn't know. Okay, a little bit more show and tell, and I promise I'll quit. His last year that he was uh, intensely working on this was in 1932. And he put together this beautiful publication on the Grand Coulee. We'll revisit this a little bit more tomorrow. This was loaned to me by Jim Gartrell. He had to pay a lot of money for this online. Uh, it's a rare book. Um, but I can, I can uh, blow up a couple of myths. One myth is that Brett's ideas were not accepted until we took photos from the air. Well, I got news for you. Here's 1932. Brett's is not believed by anybody. And he's got air photographs. And he's still a joke for another two, three decades. So if you've heard that way of telling the story, that it's not until you got to the air that you could see Brett's work, that's baloney. I'm getting greedy now. Let me, let me show you the, oh. <laughs> so here, this is an original, by the way, from 1932. So here are these aerial photographs. Back in the day, we used uh, stereo glasses to kind of see things in 3D. He's, uh, that was at Northrop Canyon and Grand Coulee. I should save this for tomorrow, actually. But there's a lot of these amazing things that are put together. I'm going to finish with this. Um, from Brett's work, uh, no. Um, at some point, Brett started writing up his experiences looking back. Some of it just a few years after the field seasons and a little bit more of the writing when he was in his retirement years and just, you know, putting, being nostalgic, basically. But in his, some of his uh, earlier scientific works in the 1920s and 30s, uh, he was writing like this in a scientific paper. And if you've read scientific papers, you know it's not like this. So things have changed a little bit writing-wise. Here's Brett's in 1927.
No one with an eye for landforms can cross eastern Washington in daylight without encountering and being impressed by the scab land. Like great scars marring the otherwise fair face to the plateau are these elongated tracks of bare black rock carved into mazes and buttes and canyons. With eyes only a few feet above the ground, the observer must travel back and forth repeatedly and must record his observations mentally photographically, by sketch and by map, before he can form anything approaching a complete picture. Yet long before the paper bearing these words has yellowed, the average observer, looking down from the air as he crosses the region, will see almost at a glance the picture here drawn by piecing together the ground level observations of months and months of work. The region is unique. Let the observer take the wings of the morning to the uttermost parts of the earth, he will nowhere find its likeness. And now I'm in the mood, so I'm gonna continue. Here's Brett's talking about working specifically out here where he has to walk for days to get to the nearest rail line with his three grad students in 1922, 1923. He's describing walking with these students. They got just enough stuff in their knapsacks to stay alive for a couple days at a time. Uh, 1923 field season. Darkness found us well past the black sand dunes that dam back Moses Lake, but open country still had enough night sky light to travel by. Then we approached some ragged rocky outcrops around which Crab Creek became almost lost. Drumheller Ranch was somewhere among the craggy black basalt knobs, blades, pinnacles, rock basins, and dry channels. He's in one of these. He and his student, I'm not flipping you off. He and one of his students are, three of his students, I'm excited now. They're walking through one of these channels, but it's getting dark. Well, we stumbled, climbed, and descended in the darkness for an hour or more, heartily sick of having attempted the traverse at night. I have since seen a topographic survey and aerial views of Drumheller channels and unhesitantly give this area the palm for complexity of all flood made topography. This is an area south of Moses Lake, north of Othello. Fairly close to midnight, we saw a single light a mile or so ahead and found easier going. We were escaping that tangle of short channels, rock basins, basalt buttes, that is, getting across the backbone of the Frenchman Springs anticline. Of course we aimed for the light. It proved to be a farmhouse. Reaching it, we saw, it gets good now. We approach a farmhouse. Reaching it, we saw through the unshaded windows a scantily clad woman fussing over two young children bedded down on the floor of bare boards. This wouldn't do this peeping Tom behavior. We shortly found the barn and a wagon loaded with newly threshed wheat. Sleeping on the wheat was the farmer. We awakened him, introduced ourselves, and craved a refuge, refuge for the remainder of the night. Yes, we could sleep on the just threshed wheat with him. The next morning, he invited the four of us to breakfast. All that his daughter could provide was a carton of breakfast flakes. Glimpses of the interior of the house showed a table and a few straight chairs, probably a better so that we didn't see. Otherwise, that house showed the direst rural poverty. We rode to Warden, town still exists, and a railroad elevator still exists. En route, the farmer told a bit of his misfortunes and stated firmly that once he got a crop, he was abandoning the farm. Years later, I saw his farm again. The house and the barn were gone. The field was gone. The site was now an active gravel pit. Yes, he had been trying to make a scabland gravel bar into a farm. The finishing part of the story is, by the time geologists got out in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, to these places and had read very carefully all of these reports that Brett's had put together 50 years earlier, he was accepted. And telegram, he was too old to go out there now, so telegrams were sent to him. Brett's, we are now all catastrophists. And then the Penrose Medal in the last decade of his life. 6.46 p.m., the end. <laughs>